eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month of the year when the war ended. Armistice Day, the moment when the guns fell silent over the battlefields of Flanders, of the east, of the west, of the north, of the south. And at that moment in time, over 17 million corpses lay in mostly in unmarked graves in the battlefields of the Somme and the other slaughtering killing fields of this, the most bloody war in history to date. Last Sunday we had, uh, as we have every year in London, a ceremony of uh, remembrance in which the Queen, the Royal Family, the politicians, the ministers, all the great and good of the land, as they say, gathered together in homage of the unmarked grave of an unknown soldier, one of innumerable unnamed soldiers who lie uh, unremembered, uncelebrated, undecorated, in the killing fields of Europe and of the Middle East, in this, uh, the, the great slaughter, as I prefer to call it. This war began in the summer of 1914 in the Balkans, in a struggle between the different uh, great powers in this cockpit of history. The explanation of this con conflict, well, there are many, as many as you care to, to mention, from uh, from the, the Kaiser's uh, withered arm to the ambitions of the British, the French, the machinations of different uh, politicians and so on. In reality, however, it was uh, the, the product, this war was a product of tensions and stresses between the main uh, powers of Europe, the imperialist powers, which had developed in reality over decades. You had even in the, in, in the 19th century, in 1870-71, the war between Prussia and France, which led to the defeat of, of France and the seizure of Alsace-Lorraine, one of the main war aims of French imperialism being the recuperation of Alsace-Lorraine. That was one of the reasons. But there were other many reasons, particularly the development of capitalism and the development, development of German capitalism in particular, as a powerful industrial and military nation, which emerged in the last decades of the, of the 19th century. This uh, growth of Germany as a world power would inevitably result, and did result, in a clash with the country that was the main imperialist power at that time, of course, which was Great Britain, which enjoyed huge, the possession of huge uh, wealthy uh, colonies of uh, covering most of Africa, most of the Indian uh, subcontinent uh, con uh, continent, and other parts of the globe. France also possessed uh, notable colonies in North Africa and elsewhere. Germany, however, this uh, mighty developing thrusting power, uh, had been more or less excluded from this, uh, this division of the world between Britain and France. Belgium also, poor little Belgium as it was uh, known, also had, uh, don't forget, uh, colonies in Africa, particularly the Congo, which it ruled with singular brutality at that time. Germany, as I say, was excluded from this and therefore was uh, uh, striving to establish itself as a world power and in the first instance as a European power. Its aim was neither more nor less than the domination of Europe. From the standpoint of, of Britain, of course, this was a serious threat. British capitalism, however, is somewhat different. British imperialism was somewhat different, very different, in fact, to France and Germany and the other countries, insofar as its geographical position created a barrier in the way to any foreign uh, invasion. Britain, as you know, is an island, or actually two islands, as it was at that time, since Ireland, of course, had not yet conquered its, uh, her independence. Therefore, from the standpoint of British imperialism, a key element in, the, in its strategic uh, interests 
was naval power. Unlike uh, the continental powers, Britain did not require a large standing army because its main line of defence, of course, was, was uh, in the sea. It was naval. And therefore, the British imperialists had a, pol a policy of always maintaining a navy which would be stronger and bigger than the, than the two nearest foreign uh, competitors or rivals, as it were. That is to say, bigger than the combined navies of France and Germany together. And they maintained this position throughout. One of the reasons why Britain went to war was that Germany was establishing not just a powerful army, a land army that is, but also was building a powerful navy. The naval question was one of the main bones of contention between Britain and Germany. The British the ruling class was watching Germany like hawks. However, Britain, the ruling class of which combined, uh, uh, the, uh, were prepared to use great violence, of course, as they did in the colonies, but they were also quite smart. They were quite uh, clever, in a sense. They had the policy of divide and rule, and therefore, publicly, and you find that still in the history, quite amusing to read the history books, that the British ruling class posed as pacifists, peace-loving, which in a sense I suppose they were. It wasn't in the interest of, of Britain to go to war, since of course they already had everything that they required. They had huge colonies, they had a virtual industrial monopoly, they had uh, huge markets abroad, and therefore they didn't really want, want to upset the apple cart. The French were in a different position because, as, as I've said, they wished to reconquer the, the lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine. But it's not just that. It isn't that the French imperialists were pa nice pacifists fi fighting a defensive war against uh, vicious, uh, brutal Germany. It wasn't that at all. The French general staff didn't just want to reconquer Alsace-Lorraine, they wanted to defeat Germany, inflict a crushing defeat such that Germany would never arise again as a powerful military state, and seize, uh, as a part of this strategy, seize the Rhineland which the French general staff has always considered to be the natural frontier between Germany and, and France. So you couldn't say that either the French or the British were genuine pacifists, or that the war was purely down to German aggression, which is the fairy story which is frequently uh, stated. What is true, there's no doubt about it, that it, was that the interest, the material interest of German capitalism at this particular moment in its history was based upon an aggressive military policy in order to conquer <coughs> the position in, in Europe and the world which they felt that Germany's industrial and financial power uh, determined. The whole thing exploded, however, not in uh, Western Europe, but in the Balkans, <coughs> which is a separate element in the equation. For a matter of decades, well back into the 19th century, Tsarist imperialism, and by the way, although Tsarist Russia was a very backward country compared to Britain or France or Germany, nevertheless it was a formidable military power with a gigantic land army and an aggressive uh, fo foreign policy. Foreign policy based upon conquering land, seizing land at the expense of other, of other nations. This uh, thrusting uh, ambition of Tsarist uh, Russia was translated in a peculiar way in the theory of Pan-Slavism, that's to say that the Tsarist, uh, this vicious uh, dictatorial autocracy, posed as the defenders of small nations. We've heard that before, we've heard it recently. The American imperialist posed as the defenders of the Kurds and the Shiites in, in Iraq. Yes, they don't... Uh, talk much about the Shiites these days, because they're, uh, they're now the enemy. But of course, the, the, uh, the adoption by big imperialist states, by great powers, of the, the right of self-determination, as they say, the rights of so-called rights of small nations, in reality is just a fig leaf uh, to disguise the imperialist uh, ag aggressive intentions of the foreign policy of these big states. In the case of Tsarist Russia, they espoused theoretically the interests of small Balkan Slav nations, particularly the, the, the Serbs, also the Bulgarians at a certain time, 
first of all against the Ottoman Empire, the, the decaying Ottoman Empire, a further factor in the equation, and of course against Austria. The ambitions of Tsarist foreign policy in the Balkans brought, brought Russia into direct confrontation with another great power, another old and decaying great power that, that, that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had their own ambitions in the Balkans, particularly in Bosnia, which they seized control of, direct control of, uh, shortly before the First World War. Serbia and Austria were engaged in, in, in a terrible power struggle, particularly after the two Balkan wars, there were two Balkan wars, which prepared the way for the First World War, uh, in which Serbia emerged uh, victorious. Bulgaria uh, was defeated in, in the process, but that's another, uh, another contradiction in this sea of contradictions which combined to create the great slaughter which began in 1914. The assassination of the Crown, Pri the, the Crown Prince of Austria in Sarajevo in the, in the summer of 1914 was merely a pretext. It was an accident in the philosophical sense of something which, uh, an event which might or might not have happened. But accidents, as Hegel uh, explained dialectically, necessity uh, often expresses itself through accidents. It's frequently the case. The assassination of the Crown Prince was, was of course, uh, an accident. What would have happened if the uh, revolver had misfired or the assassin had missed his target, which nearly occurred, as a matter of fact? Would that have prevented the First World War? Of course not. Of course not. The assassination of the Crown Prince in Sarajevo did not cause the First World War. That's a very superficial and false uh, argument, but it was the accident through which necessity expressed itself. It was inevitable that these great powers were going to come into direct conflict over one issue or other. As a matter of fact, there, there were a whole series of uh, incidents prior to 1914 where they almost came to, to blows. The Agadir incident, the Morocco incident, an indication of German ambitions to oust the French from, from from control of Morocco. Almost led to, to, to the outbreak of hostilities, but they pulled back at the last minute because they weren't yet ready to enter the, uh, the conflict. The events in Sarajevo, however, acted as a catalyst, as a detonator to this gigantic uh, powder keg which had been created. It had been built up in reality over years and decades. Finally, this reached its tipping point, as they say. That point in which quantity becomes transformed into quality. The Austrian general staff used this as a convenient excuse to, to uh, attack Serbia, which in turn provoked the Russians into organizing a general mobilization, which in turn uh, caused a, a direct conflict with, with German imperialism, which sided, of course, with, uh, with Austria. And therefore, these uh, events, small in themselves, because the assassination, although it was, uh, it made the headlines at the time, it, it, it didn't necessarily mean that there was going to be war, but the conditions were there, and therefore it did lead to the war. what was called at the time the Great War. That's what it was called. I've got a book in my house with that title, The Great War. Nothing great about it from the standpoint of the working class. I prefer, or it was also called The Great War for Civilization, I beg your pardon. The Great War for Civilization, or the War to End All Wars. Well, that sounds very uh, ironical in view of what happened subsequently. I personally prefer to call it the Great Slaughter, the Great Imperialist uh, Slaughter, which led to the deaths, at least, of 17 million people, and a further 20 million uh, wounded, injured, blinded, limbless, the war veterans, which subsequently were reduced to begging for a, a slice of bread on the streets of Europe when the slaughter had finished. And all the talk about glorious, heroic deeds and so on, it was just an excuse, uh, a fig leaf to cover the naked, imperialist, aggressive ambitions of all the powers. It's wrong to, to point the finger just at one, just at Germany, although Germany, of course, did have an aggressive policy. So did all the others. 
It, they were all thieves, as Lenin described them, a, a thieves' kitchen, a band of robbers determined to crush and exploit and, uh, and oppress their, uh, their, the, the, other, the other robbers. That's the, the, the truth of the matter. But of course, that was not immediately evident to, to, to the masses in any of the countries. It wasn't uh, clear. If I might uh, be permitted to make a personal uh, observation, one of those who flocked and volunteered, who flocked to the, to, to, to the flag, to the, to the army, in September 1914 was my grandfather, uh, George Woods, who was a young metal worker at the time, a steel worker from South Wales. Attracted to the army as a volunteer, they were all volunteers by the way, there was no conscription at that time, it was a voluntary affair. And it's true that a large number, hundreds of thousands of young men, like my grandfather, flocked to the armed forces on the basis of the imperialist propaganda, the patriotic uh, wave that swept society, that always sweeps through any society at the beginning of any war. The flag waving, the patriotism, the uh, handsome uniforms, all the rest of this, uh, this nonsense. I well remember as a child that my grandfather had a, a tattoo on his arm of a lady with, with, with a shield and, uh, and a helmet and so on. I didn't realize who this lady was, but of course it was Britannia, the symbol of British imperialism, if you like. And therefore, clearly my grandfather had this tattoo done when he was in the army in France, like many others, indicates that he, at that time he had a patriotic mentality. I also have in my house uh, a large family Bible with my grandfather's war record in it, which indicates that he was re profoundly religious, like many people at that time. Yes, but in the course of that war, or after the war in particular, with the ferocious class struggle that uh, erupted in Britain in general, and South Wales in particular, my grandfather became a communist joined the Communist Party and he remained a communist until the end of his life. He joined the army, as I said, in, in, in September 1914 and remained in the army, if I'm not mistaken, until May 1919. The war ended in November 19, uh, 1918, 101 years ago. He survived, I don't know how he survived in, in, in France. He was in direct uh, military action in France throughout the war. He was gassed it's true, and had subsequently had problems with his, uh, with his lungs. But he survived at least, which of course millions of others did not survive. But what happened in the case of my grandfather happened to, to millions of others. Workers in uniform that went through the horrific experience of the war, of the great slaughter, they saw the reality. I've just read a wonderful book by the French writer who also became a communist on the basis of his experience, Henri Barbus, French title is Le Feu, it's a famous uh, novel about the First World War. English title is Under Fire, I strongly recommend it. If you want to know the reality of trench, or the horrible reality of French warfare, you read that book. It, it tells you more than, than, than all the other nonsense that, it, that, 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 that is written. Of course, nowadays it's fashionable. It wasn't so fashionable at the time, but nowadays it's fashionable to weep crocodile tears about the terrible waste, the terrible loss of human life. Yes, of course, there was a terrible loss of human life. But I would maintain that, that, that a lot of this pacifist nonsense is, is, is purely hip hypocritical. These are crocodile tears. People that, uh, even if they mean well, they don't understand the First World War. They don't know the first thing about it. The real lesson to be drawn was not pacifism, not, not a, a dislike of war, the real lesson is what occurred in November 1917 in Russia. And I would add to that November 1918 in Germany because it was the German revolution, the German working class, that really put an end to the First World War, nobody else. The real lesson is that war, although initially it causes a wave of patriotism, it cuts across the class, class struggle, that was the case in Russia in particular, always tends to end in revolution. That was the case. It was a terrible school of death, of suffering, of mass murder, of all kinds of terrible uh, inhumanity. That's perfectly true. But through that harsh school, people 
men at the front began to draw conclusions. Women, women also on the home front, as in the Glasgow rent strike of exactly a hundred years ago, 1915. Or the women, wor women workers in the factories in, in, in Petrograd, who in effect started the, the February Revolution in Russia. Throughout all the, these horrors that are taking place, people begin to understand, people begin to, to grasp that something is fundamentally wrong, something is fundamentally wrong with this war, something is fundamentally wrong with this society, and there becomes a burning desire to change it through revolutionary means. Oh yes, oh yes, my friends, no doubt about it. War is a terrible school, but it's a school that leads invariably in the direction of revolution or counter-revolution. That's also possible, of course. And therefore, on this uh, anniversary of these titanic events, these bloody events, uh, we do not share in the crocodile tears of the ruling class, these well-dressed, smartly dressed hypocrites, these ladies and gentlemen, who of course played no role whatsoever in the fighting. There was a program recently on the television exposing the role of, uh, who was then the Prince of Wales, subsequently became for a short period the, the King of England, uh, Edward the, the Eighth. Uh, oh yes, this playboy spent all his war in shadows, drinking champagne and, 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 and attending smart balls. He later became a fascist, by the way. People don't uh, an admirer of Hitler, you know. And that was typical of all these people, all these generals, all these uh, rotten aristocrats and so on. They had it. Oh, what a lovely war! I think there's a musical to that effect. Yes, oh, what a lovely war! Then they come every November, weeping crocodile tears in front of the the, the, the senator. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I don't. I note, for example, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn was. He attended it. He went along with it. He, I suppose he had no alternative. And yet he was still sub subjected to vicious, uh, spiteful attacks in the press uh, subsequently. No, 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 I don't buy this. this, this. It, it is, it's actually an insult to the memory of the millions who, who died in a useless, imperialist, vicious slaughter, which is now being prettified as a great war for... They, they're reviving the old myth of war for civilization. What a joke. Do we sympathise with, with, the, with the dead, of course, and their families, of course. These are the real victims, most of them. The overwhelming majority of working class people who had to suffer subsequently. The grim life of unemployment, of misery, of poverty, the wives struggling to pay the rent, the kids starving in the case of the, the coal miners of South Wales. Those are the real victims, of, the real heroes, if you like, and the real victims. And therefore, in this moment, this uh, anniversary, we have no intention of singing the national anthem, God Save the Queen. We have no intention of bowing our heads or weeping crocodile tears. We utilize this great uh, occasion to dedicate ourselves to the sacred cause, of, which really would mean the end of all wars, the end of all imperialist slaughter. And that is, say, the sacred cause of the emancipation of the working class in Britain, in Europe, and on a world scale. The sacred cause of the socialist revolution, which is the final answer to all, this, all the nightmare of wars, of uh, oppression, of exploitation by, of, of one human being by another, and the struggle for a new and better world, a struggle for world socialism.